Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much for inviting me, Deidre, Professor Carla uh, Sinapoli, where is she? And um, uh, Miss Kate Wright, thank you for, um, you know, uh, having a chance to present my work here today. Uh, I also wanted to congratulate the previous um, presenters. They were brilliant papers. I really enjoyed hearing your research. So it's, uh, it's an amazing, I mean, Michigan is amazing as an, an institution, uh, and we are, uh, you know, um, we are looking at the photographs of a man who um, nationalists, uh, Filipino nationalists, described and called as a vampire. So let's just remember that, that, you know, this is the, this is the uh, alma mater of the vampire. So there's a reason for that, and I'll be, I'll be explaining that in my, uh, my paper, I hope. Um, so my presentation today is taken from a chapter from my book manuscript, Body Parts of Empire, Visual Abjection, Filipino Images, and the American Archive. The book is a study of American imperial abjection from the turn of the 20th century. The visual abject in this case is every image, photograph, narrative, or cultural relic connected to a forgotten American imperial war in the Pacific, the Philippine-American War, which launched the United States as an imperial power in Asia. A central argument of my study is that the colonization of the Philippine Islands by the United States witnessed the rise of visual and print technologies and created abject peoples whom American imperialism rejects but cannot do without. These abject peoples are most notably non-whites, bodies that the U.S. nation then and now uh, seeks to expunge even as the expelled abject haunts the subject as its inner constitutive boundary. In other words, abjection is the process for analyzing the sensory conditions for perceiving the American empire through the actual body subjected to its violence and benevolence. As figures in an archive, abject bodies are icons and indices of the U.S. nation's institutionalized acts of forgetting, repressing, and revising the violent occupation of its first colony in Asia. American imperial abjection will be discussed through a reconsideration of forgotten popular objects, in this case, colonial photographs such as Worcester's um, archive and other Filipino colonial images, produced during the period of the Philippine-American War of 1899. Rather than a cultural history of this imperial ephemera, my discussion will focus on the logics and visual forms of American imperial abjection as it scans different colonial figures of the American empire, the dead bodies of Filipino insurrectos or rebels, and Fili Filipino women and school children who lived in the Philippines during and after the war. Abjection in this study is the process we trace in American popular culture that creates bodies that violently disturb US national identity. The, ab the abject is reproduced by the nexus of racialization and sexualization. And in the history of the American empire, abject bodies occupy the ragged edges of modernity that American imperialism cannot do without. In the late 19th century, sites of American abjection were Indian reservations and native boarding schools, plantations in the South, factories in the industrial North, immigrant immigrant ghettos in the urban centers, orphanages and, as and asylums, the segregated military camps, saloons and brothels, and the United States' newest acquisitions of island colonies and territories. The production of abjection is the creation of images and discourses from these sites that are racially repugnant and sexually erotic, yet formative to American imperial identity. Public culture, which includes popular cultural forms, reproduce and stage the paradox of abjection as a foundational aspect of American empire building. By visualizing abject bodies, white American imperial identities are reframed, romanticized, and memorialized. These abject bodies of savagery and sexuality then become negative markers of the American imperial self-image, but only after they have served as catalysts of empire and then discarded. So for the remainder of my time, uh, my talk will be divided into three parts, three body parts. Uh, the first part will be a discussion of images of cadavers or the enemy corpse 
in the American imperial imagination. The second part will be on the savage breast or the trope of colonial nakedness or the trope of negation. The second part, um, I mean, and then the, after the, part, the second part, I'll be reading the final uh, part of the talk, which will be on dark skin, in particular, the imperial trope of debasement embodied in the figure of the Filipino colonial ward or child, uh, once a primitive, now transformed by American, uh, American education or American imperial modernity. And then I'll end with a photograph I found in the New York Historical Society that I believe captures the legacy of Worcester's photographs. Um, so um, to begin, I'd like to start with the ideas of feminist critic uh, Julia Kristeva, whose work has influenced post-colonial studies, queer studies, and ethnic studies. Kristeva writes that abjection is what, quote, beseeches, worries, and fascinates desire which nevertheless does not let itself be seduced. Apprehensive desire turns aside, sickened it rejects, end quote. Objection causes, and this is a quote again from Kristeva, quote, a vortex of summons and repulsion. And I want us to remember this idea of repulsion, um, you know, as we uh, see some of the images. She adds that abjection is what is radically separate, loathsome, and this is again a quote from Kristeva. Not me, not that, but not nothing either, as something that I do not recognize as a thing, on the edge of non-existence and hallucination of a reality that, if I acknowledge it, annihilates me, end quote. Here lies the power of photographs of corpses. The corpse does not signify death, according to Kristeva because the body fluids that emanate from the fresh corpse show the living viewer the very fluids that support life. Kristeva writes, quote, these body fluids, this defilement, this shit are what life withstands, hardly and with difficulty on the part of death. My body extricates itself as being alive from that border. Such waste drops so that I might live until from loss to loss. Nothing remains in me, and my entire body falls beyond the limit. Cadere, cadaver, end quote. The photographic image of the corpse then, what Kristeva, Kristeva describes as, quote, the most sickening of wastes, is the border of the national and imperial imagination. Images of death are the boundaries of the imperial self and the artifacts of American imperial nationhood. As Alan Trachtenberg reminds us, Civil War images participate by proposing the visual terms on which vit victory and healing, the remembrance of sacrifice, might be conceived." End quote. I would add that the visual terms of victory and healing rested on race and gender, specifically through the sanctified bodies of white male American soldiers. Civil War photographs, such as uh, what we are seeing, Brady's iconic Harvest of Death, transform the savagery of war, in particular the nation's memories of deaths of hundreds of thousands of mostly white American soldiers, into martyrdom and the sacred. Civil War photographs thus preserve the peace of mind and equanimity of the white American middle class viewer by presenting pain and death as sacred. Or, as Kristeva put it, my body extricates itself as being alive from that border, end quote. So the sight of the severed limbs and mutilated corpses of tens of thousands of white Americans published in American newspapers during the Civil War represented American nationhood while muting the deaths of native peoples captured by the American camera. And so we have to remember that the Indian Wars were going on at the time. Decades after the Civil War, American photography enthusiasts could purchase photographs of good or dead Indians. The popular late 19th century phrase, quote, the only, good the only good Indian is a dead Indian, is a racial expression that embodies the refashioning of the slaughter and domination of native peoples into humorous entertainment. And by the late 19th century, after the US Army's genocidal military campaigns and conquest of Native American lands, the once threatening Indians were now good, either dead or confined in reservations. By 1899, the first year of the Philippine-American War, an old American visual tradition took new form with new racial subjects. 
Rather than images of dead Native Americans, what were published and sold commercially were photographs of dead Filipino insurrectos, along with ethnographic images that produced narratives of exotic yet docile Filipino savages, with the Indian savage pacified through genocidal military campaigns and their forced incarceration in reservations by the century's turn, the Filipino insurgent became the new unruly savage body fighting a guerrilla war. An artifact of modernity that captured images of dead Filipinos is the stereoscopic card, a mounted photograph that had a three-dimensional effect that is viewed through a device called the stereoscope. Uh, and what, what you're seeing right now are just examples of American visual culture and how it was very ordinary to buy, uh, you know, cameras and uh, photographs from uh, the Philippine-American War uh, and, of course, the Spanish-American War. Stereographs were popular diversions, and we're going to see here an example. This is an example of a stereograph. Were popular diversions for middle-class white Americans to view and experience the Philippine campaigns and to see the United States' new marvelous possessions, um, one did not have to merely imagine what the Philippine-American War was like, since you could order these cards or these stereo views. Um, the lifelike quality of stereo cards allowed one to see more than mere ske artist sketches, but what was uh, advertised then as facsimiles of real scenes. At the turn of the 20th century, the star of the American empire burned bright. In magazines and journals of the time, advertisements for war views and pictorial books were published alongside ads for breakfast cocoa and cough drops. During this period, the photographic industries of France, Britain, and the United States underwent radical technological change. Innovations such as the mass production of photographic equipment opened up new consumer markets and accelerated the growth of the photographic industry. At the turn of the century, it was common practice for American soldiers and visitors to Manila to collect inexpensive postcards and to take pictures of Philippine scenes with their brownie cameras. At the time, the Kodak company offered inexpensive roll film that printed small photographic prints for souvenir albums. The Philippine Commission under Dean Wooster that governed the Philippine Islands hired, quote, 276 professional photographers in the Philippines to take photographs for U.S. government projects. Apart from personal photographs, several companies sold stereo views such as Underwood and Underwood, Keystone, Kilburn, and H.C. White. So what you see are some examples. Uh, some are from Underwood and some are from the stereo uh, companies that I just mentioned. War scenes such as these were not only popular entertainment, but educational. Public schools around the country bought box sets or stereo views sold in special containers as a unit. By 1901, Underwood and Underwood produced and sold almost 25,000 stereographs per day. By 1924, the Keystone Company produced sets of 1,000 stereo views with accompanying handbooks. These visual aids were seen by millions of American children in schools or in churches. The popularity of war photographs, stereoscope viewers, and illustrated journals can be read as the American public's support for American expansion. It can also be read as the fascination for what were then the new imperial technologies of vision. The violence of a war of conquest was viewed as a, at a safe distance in the comfort of their late Victorian homes, what the late scholar Jim Zwick has called the war from the parlor. Turn of the century, Americans saw violent photographs of the war, such as images of Filipino corpses in trenches after battle that were published in newspapers of the time. But the captions on the photographs uh, and the stereographs uh, emphasized the military victory of the U.S. Army and not the violence. These visual technologies that focused on victory over violence were important for uh, the capillaries of empire. Uh, this is from Alfred McCoy, you know, um, the idea of um, uh, technologies as capillaries of empire. An American empire in the Pacific was created not only through violence, such as, such as through the enforcement of a military occupation with 70,000 troops, with Gatling guns, repeating rifles, the, the telegraph, police, and surveillance uh, strategies. 
The U.S. empire was also created through these photographic images. An army of American photographers, scholars, journalists, artists, and creative writers supported the lifeblood of the American empire and produced what Lanny Thompson calls an imperial archipelago. Visual imagery on the Philippine colony served military and ideological purposes. Photographic images served the U.S. Empire's need for serviceable information that enabled military strength, produced consent at home, and silenced dissent in the Philippines and in the United States. American Empire builders had many tools, and the most important was the modern camera. To create consent and support for the forced occupation of the Philippine Islands, photography took on the ideological work of representing the pleasures and profits of empire building through necropolitics, what Ashil Bembe describes as the supreme exercise of the power to kill, to allow to live, or to expose to death certain persons. As Saheed R. Chowdhury observes in his study of colonial photographs of India from the Sepoy Revolt, British colonial photographs document the conditions by which colonial violence becomes possible, acceptable, and legitimate. He argues for analyzing the cultural work of photography or how photographs of the 19th century or how photographs of 19th century India circulated and legitimized British rule. I would add that Filipino colonial photographs, such as the photographs produced by uh, Wooster and others, disseminated and others disseminated the sensory conditions that rendered American imperial modernity visible and legible, what Susan Sontag describes as a grammar and an interpretation of the world that created the racial and gender justifications of American imperial rule in the Philippines. Colonial photographs on the Philippines from the late 19th century and onwards are visual forms of American necropolitics based on US colonial colonial hierarchies of race and gender. The Filipino colonial photograph takes part in war by documenting those who are agents, icons, and symbols of US imperial power, the American soldier's figure, right? And those who should be subjects of imperial violence, those who must be subjected to the terror of US colonial rule. This next part of my talk examines nakedness, particularly the savage breast as abject metaphor. I have graciously um, borrowed uh, these images from Professor Sinopoli's excellent archival work in the CD, Imperial Imaginings, the Dean C. Wooster Photographic Collection of the Philippines. Um, scholar Philippa Levine writes that titillation was unquestionably part of the attraction to taking pictures of naked indigenous women during the Victorian era and after. Photographs such as these circulated as erotica as well as science, and it continues to this day. If you wanted to purchase these kinds of photographs, you could look at it online. Uh, they sell them as ethnic nudes. Um, so um, as Levine put it, uh, this is a quote from Philippa Levine, uh, quote, the naked native captured on canvas and film was not only authentic because in a state of undress, but knowable, for there could be no hiding, no concealment. Only by laying the native bare could she be, could she be fully known, studied, and understood. The function then of naked natives was as much classificatory as it was purient, end quote. And so in the name of science, the hypersexualization of the Filipina native and the abjecthood of the Filipino body in general are created by science. And these images articulate American necropolitics. Here are the bodies that must be subjected to American colonial rule. Proof of their savage status is their state of undress, their savage nakedness. Levine, quote, the nude woman was an archetype, a figure representing uh, the woman unspoiled, unsullied by the march of time. And of course, we also connect this to uh, the colony. The scantily clad native was lacking history, lacking shame, lacking clothes, end quote. So while, nakes while nakedness had no place in the public domain of the civilized West, the needs of science and education called for the creation of images of naked savages. So while the naked savage body was an abject image that was a source of embarrassment or horror, it also invoked pleasure, sexual pleasure, as well as the visual affirmation of colonial knowledge and power. 
the imperial trope of surveillance and appropriation, or the bodies of natives as colonial trophies, are at work in these images. I've written about the erotics of the American empire in another essay, and how the image of the Filipina savage draws from earlier colonial imaginaries of black and brown women. In that early essay, I did not mention Worcester's, um, I say Worcester because that's how Filipinas pronounce it, but it's Wooster, I know. I, you know, anyway, whatever. He's a vampire, anyway. Um, in that early essay, I did not mention Wooster's voluminous archive. Professor uh, Sinopoli's work made me realize that Wooster was probably the most important source for the sexualized image of the Filipino savage. It is no wonder that he was so reviled by Filipino intellectuals who lived during the early years of American colonial rule. This final part of my talk examines images and photographs of Filipino school children as icons of abjection or the visual forms of empire. While photographs of brown children in their white uniforms and starched dresses suggest peace, progress, and colonial modernity, we must consider that these images were made during a time of guerrilla war and the creation of the new American military science known as counterinsurgency. In a guerrilla war, nothing is clearly evident, and so images from the period are haunted by the Filipino peasant uprisings that occurred at the time. And for the American colonial government, there was no difference between a Filipino native civilian and an insurrecto. Due to the nature of guerrilla warfare, the US Army was not sure who was friend or foe, who was amigo, Spanish for friend, or insurrecto. By January 1902, with news of atrocities committed by American troops and the continuation of Filipino resistance, despite the arrest of Aguinaldo, American soldiers ironically referred to Filipinos as amigos. Many believed that, that, quote, the only true amigo is the dead amigo. Stereograph companies even sold photographs of dead Filipino amigos, using the phrase as a caption for the stereoscopes. The racial terms of good Indian and Filipino amigo were products of the refashioning of war and slaughter into racial humor. American journalist Stephen Bonsal, who visited the Philippines for three months in 1902 during the guerrilla phase of the Philippine-American War, writes in his account that despite the American government reports, the rebellion was chronic, uh, that's a term he uses, and even with 50,000 troops that were all over the Philippine Islands after the declaration of the end of the war, the Filipino guerrillas were winning with their strategies of, quote, subterfuge and disguise. So at the time of guerrilla warfare, when visibility and Filipino loyalty were put into question, Filipino bodies became even more visible to the American public through commercial stereographs that showed images of Filipino school children and students. The little brown ward of American democracy became America's abject icon. Viewed by turn of the century Americans through racial and gendered frames of savagery, docility, and defeat, American imperial violence was muted if not hidden. At the center of the counterinsurgency operations was Wooster. He became an important part of the spy system of US Commander General Elwell Otis. With the charge of spies under his wing, Wooster would pound on his typewriter every morning to prepare dossiers and reports on the failings of Filipino leaders. In his first years as Interior Secretary, Wooster collected confidential files on Filipino leaders who were perceived by Wooster and the military governments military government as threats to American business interests or military rule. These images of docile school children then must be seen as the visual forms of the American empire. The production of Filipino docility through the image of the colonial ward or the student, uh, the brown child, suppressed the continuing Filipino resistance to American colonial rule. These images seem to say, we won this battle. The Katipunan is dead. The insurrection is over. The rhetoric of Filipino savagery and docility, then, are part of the grammar of American imperial abjection. In conclusion, I wanted to end by showing this lovely photograph I found in the New York Historical Society. I found this image of a young Filipino native baby, and it was, you could see the scribble, it says Filipino baby, and it also was recorded as Igorot baby. Uh, the child must have been part of a live exhibit in a fair in Coney Island in New York. Uh, I'm trying to understand if the child was tied 
for theatrical effect or maybe the native people on display wanted to make sure that she didn't fall while um, she was standing for the exhibit. I found the image by searching for Filipino in the archives records. There is some scribbling on the photograph, but no information regarding the photographer or when the photograph was taken. As an abject image, the photograph disturbs and also fascinates me. As Kristeva reminds us, this abject image is, quote, a vortex of summons and repulsion. This image is not me, not that, but not nothing either. I recognize that this image belongs to the history of Filipinos in the Philippines, as well as Filipino immigrants in the United States. The Filipino child is, after all, a child of war and empire. Thank you. Uh, and like my colleagues, speakers before me, I'd like to um, thank the organizers of this. Uh, Nerissa, do you want this? No, not say, okay. Don't say. Uh, and I'm very excited to be part of this um, conference for a variety of reasons, if I can get this open. Uh, one of which is that I actually uh, have a, a book forthcoming about the photography of Dean Wooster uh, with the University of Michigan Press uh, slated for, at this point, a January 2014 um, publication date. And, and so much of what I'm talking about today uh, comes, from, comes from this project. So there's the vampire there, uh, <laughs> to your right as you're looking at him. Uh, and so what I want to talk about today are a few specific examples from the photographic legacy of Dean Wooster that serve to illustrate Wooster's shifting ideas about racial and cultural uh, identifications and classifications in the Philippines. These examples can also help reveal the slippery nature of the categories that Wooster and his fellow colonialists employed in the early years of the 20th century in order to demonstrate the supposed lack of Filipino national identity. And I want to just actually say, I meant to say, this was one of the most widely circulated uh, photographs that Wooster used. He made this in February of 1901, and when he embarked on a lecture series in the United States in 1913 to advertise that, he sent out a press release with this photograph to newspapers around the country, and this became sort of the defining image of, of what he was setting out to do. While official U.S. colonial policy divided the Philippines into two distinct categories of Christian and non-Christian, Wooster developed a more complex system that placed all Filipinos on a, continu on a continuum of civilization. Although Wooster did not deny the importance of the cleavage between Christian and non-Christian, uh, indeed his activities as Secretary of the Interior demanded uh, that cleavage, uh, throughout his career he fine-tuned his own understanding of different ethno-linguistic groups in the Philippines. Moreover, he was able to promote his own vision of the Philippines through numerous illustrated magazine articles, most notably in National Geographic magazine, and also in his two books, the 1898 book, uh, The Philippine Islands and Their People, and then his two-volume 1914 book, The Philippines Past and Present. The alphanumeric system that structures Wooster's photographic archive is critical for our understanding of Wooster's beliefs about race and identity in the Philippines, and is the first example I'd like to talk about. The evidence suggests that this system evolved sometime between 1902 and 1905, in other words, more or less concurrently with the 1903 Philippines census that historian Paul Kramer said, quote, formally installed the administrative difference between Christians and non-Christians, making Hispanic civilization the most important state racial boundary line in the process, end quote. The census determined that there were 24 tribes, again, we're always with those, uh, in the Philippines, eight of them Christian and civilized, and 16 of them Christian, hence wild. I, I'm sorry, 16 of them non-Christian, hence wild. Wooster, on the other hand, had many more categories. The archive of Wooster negatives here at the University of Michigan includes 31 different cultural categories that Wooster used to classify Filipinos. And it starts with one and ends at 49, but there are gaps uh, in there. This classification scheme was designed in a hierarchical fashion with category number one, the Negritos, being the least civilized. And Wooster referred to them regularly as a disappearing race of people who may be a missing link. And the Spanish and German mestizos, category number 49, being the most civilized. It seems, though, that Wooster didn't initially organize his photographs with such a hierarchy in mind. 
The earliest evidence I've seen of Wooster attempting to organize a classification scheme for his photographs that emphasized diversity came in 1902 when he sent nearly 200 photographs to William Henry Holmes at the United States National Museum in Washington, D.C. Wooster organized the photographs into 19 different categories as seen here. As in the University of Michigan archive, Negritos were listed first. The rest of the categories, however, were listed in a roughly geographic orientation, moving from the Igorots of northern Luzon down to the Kalaganas of southern Mindanao, and then circling around to uh, the Togbanuas of the Calamian Islands north of uh, Palawan. In 1902, Wooster had not yet encountered all of the different Philippine ethno-linguistic groups that he would come to describe and classify prior to his 1913 resignation as Secretary of the Interior. But by 1905, his range of travels had become much more extensive and his categories subsequently more elaborate. The three sets of prints, num numbering more than 5,000 each, that he sold in 1905 and 1906 to Edward E. Ayer, W. Cameron Forbes, and George Cooper's Luzon, reveal a much longer list of categories, and it is at this point that we can see Wooster's hierarchy at work. Here again, the Negritos are listed first, with the Visayans, what he said numerically uh, was the most important civilized or uncivilized tribe in the Philippine Islands, placed at the top of the hierarchy, though at the bottom of the list. Uh, the Zamboanganos were said to be descendants of slaves brought to Zamboanga from other parts of the Philippines, and the other three categories were populations that were not actually Filipino populations uh, in the way Wooster was um, uh, classifying and describing. So if we put all three of the classifications next to each other, and this next slide is going to be quite dense and you're not going to be able to see it, so I'll point some things out. Um, we can see where there are some important shifts in the classifications employed by Wooster in 1902, 1905, and at the end of his life in 1924. Right? So the, the negatives here at the University of Michigan, uh, that archive is an archive that Wooster really didn't have a lot of control over editing prior to it going out. Right? He dies and then they get distributed. Earlier on, he had the say in how he wanted to structure and organize these kinds of things. So what I have here uh, in 1902 in the blue are categories that are specific to, uh, to 1902. Let me see if I have them listed here. OK, so yeah. thus in, in 1902, Wooster had categories for miscellaneous Somales and Guiangas that don't appear anyplace else. In 1905, he had categories for Mandayans, Dulanganes, Subanos, Zambals, Bicos, Chinese, Mestizos, and mixed populations that, again, don't appear anywhere else uh, in his, in his uh, various classifications. And then at the end of his career, he had categories for Spaniards and Spanish-German Mestizos. And I just want to add real quick that I'm dying to know what happens right here. He has all these numbers set aside in 1924 that as far as we know, there are no photographs existing, right? Was there ever anything in category 33 or 34 anywhere along the way? We don't know. I mean, maybe that information will be revealed someday. But at this point, there are a lot of empty spaces in this classification scheme that suggest that there were things at work that we just don't know about yet. The second example I'd like to talk about is the complicated relationship between Wooster's categories and those officially defined in the 1903 Census of the Philippines. As noted before, the census established a bifurcated vision of the Philippines between the majority Christian population and the minority non-Christian population. In this slide, we can compare the officially recognized categories from the census, which are there to the left, which were not listed in series uh, format. They weren't listed in, in a hierarchical format. There's just the cleavage between civilized and, and uncivilized. Uh, and then Wooster's more elaborate uh, categories. And when you look at this uh, slide, and again, you probably can't read all of this, uh, and I apologize for that. What we see in the green and the categories to the 1903 census are categories that appear in the census that Wooster never employed. Okay, so, so Wooster never had a category called Cagayan or Batak or Tagabili. Okay, he didn't use that himself. Uh, and the blue are categories that Wooster used that never appeared in the census. So Wooster had this, his own set of classifications. And then what we have in the peach color there is in the 1903 census, there was one category for, for uh, Igoro. And for Wooster, that was separated out into uh, Bontoc Igorots, Benguet Igorots, 
Uh, the census collapsed Kalingas and Tingians and Ifugaos into the category of Igorot, but Wooster kept those out as separate categories himself. So there's a great deal of overlap, but not complete matching. When the U.S. published the results of its 1903 census, uh, the volumes were liberally illustrated with photographs taken from the Wooster archive. The first volume alone contained more than 100 photographs showing everything from tree ferns to ovens to, quote, represent representative types of different tribes, both civilized and wild. Curiously, some of the photographs were labeled as showing members of groups that the census didn't include. Take, for example, the six Wooster photographs that appeared opposite page 458. Oh, whoops, I'm sorry, let me back up real quick. I forgot I inserted this slide as well. This shows the skewing of Wooster's photographs compared to the census. I meant to point this out as well. So the blue columns show the, the, the population counts for uh, Visayan, Tagalog, uh, Ilocano, uh, Igorot, and Negrito. And then the, the red uh, superimposed on top are the number of photographs in the 1905 index that Wooster prepared uh, showing how his representations of the Philippine were, were, were shaping up. And it's almost a complete inverse uh, representation, okay? So there's 871 photographs of Igorots and only 44 Visayans, okay? Uh, so this is how Wooster was, was visually uh, recording and depicting the Philippines. I apologize for having to step back to that. Okay, so take, for example, the six Wooster photographs that appeared opposite page 458 in the first volume of the census report. In the accompanying caption that you can't read at the bottom, uh, the upper two rows are said to show various remontado types, uh, individuals, despite the fact that Remontado was not one of the 24 tribes identified by the census. And the Remontado were said to be civilized Filipinos who had left town to go live among the wild tribes. Uh, Benito Vergara notes that, it, that the introduction to the census made a passing reference to the Remontado and to other groups that were not in the official count of the census. And he points out that the effort of the census, quote, to impose rigid official classifications, end quote, kept bumping up against alternative categories used by various anthropologists and writers. So thus, Wooster was both a provider of photographs for the census report and one of the writers whose understandings of the Philippines differed from the official story presented by the census. So he's, he's in there in two different ways. But it isn't just that these photographs contradict the official categories of the census. Two of the captions also contradict the captions to the same photographs found elsewhere in the Wooster archive. For example, the photograph on the left in the middle row is captioned in this slide as girl, Remontado. Here she is again, uh, as she appeared in the photograph that Wooster sold to Ayer in 1905, part of a series of six photographs captioned young Kalinga girls showing typical dress and ornaments. This particular photograph is not in the archive here at the University of Michigan, but other photographs from the series are, and they are dated to August 1901, taken in the town of Ilagan in the province of Isabella. What is significant here is that this girl isn't a Remontado at all, but is instead a Kalinga. The photograph of this girl was made during the same visit to Ilagan as the bottom two photographs in the previous slide seen here. In the census, the, event, the individual seen in the left-hand photograph here is identified as a girl, Gadan, but in the index that Wooster sold to air, he's identified as one in a series of five photographs of typical Kalinga men. And I would venture to say that that is in fact a man. Um, the reasons for such inconsistencies in the identification and captioning of photographs used in the census report is unclear. Part of me wants to think that Wooster was showing subtle resistance to the categories that the census imposed on people, including himself, that he felt belonged in different categories, and he was a bullheaded guy, so I wouldn't be surprised if he said, you know, okay, you can use the photographs, but these are remontado, and you're going to caption remontado. Uh, but that would only explain the use of Remontado as a category. It wouldn't explain why Remontado was used to describe Kalinga, nor would it explain why Kalinga man was identified as a girl. Those indicate little more than sloppiness on the part of whoever assembled the collage plates to illustrate the census report. Uh, and it's possible and likely, in fact, that the photographs were less important in terms of their accuracy than they were in representing to American readers of the census report and of the 1905 National Geographic article that reprinted many of these uh, uh, photographs, the scope of the civilizing project that lay before them. As Vergara writes, the photographs in the census show the importance of the imperial, imperialist project. The pictures of wild tribes not only showed the extent of civilizing needed, but also fed the consistent doubt on the capacity of the Filipinos to govern themselves. Seen from this perspective, 
whatever internal quibbles Wooster might have had with the census categories, he was in full accord with the larger imperialist message uh, and imperialist imperative of the, uh, of the census. So the last two examples I'd like to talk about, both came, come from Wooster articles in National Geographic magazine, one from 1911 and another from 1912. Those two articles and a third published in 1913 were among Wooster's last and most vigorous efforts to convince Americans that the Philippines were in no way fit for self-government. And all three articles were heavily illustrated. Two of them, in fact, were the entire issues of National Geographic magazine, which was almost unprecedented at that time. And all three focused exclusively on the non-Christian populations of the Philippines. In his 1911 article, Field Sports Among the Wild Men of Northern Luzon, Wooster opened by noting that his, quote, acquaintance with the wild men of Northern Luzon began in July 1900, shortly after the arrival of the Second Philippine Commission in, at Manila, end quote. He then explained that his ongoing investigations had revealed, quote, that there are but seven non-Christian tribes in Northern Luzon, end quote, and that the earlier estimates of a larger number of tribes were mistakes that could be chalked up both to inexperience and to a reliance on the existing literature, quote, which was full of contradictions and obvious misstatements. End quote. By way of example, he noted Fernando Blumentritt's estimate of 36 tribes, while the Jesuits at, in Manila put the number at uh, 26. Despite his claim to having a fixed understanding of Filipino tribal categories in 1911, the next year, Wooster modified his understandings of non-Christian Filipinos yet again. The number of non-Christian tribes in northern Luzon remained fixed at seven, but in his 1912 uh, National Geographic article, Headhunters of Northern Luzon, he decided to categorize as headhunting a tribe that he previously had not classified as such. As Wooster wrote, quote, three years ago, had anyone stated in my presence that the Negritos or any of them were headhunters, I should promptly have questioned the truth of the, of the allegation, but I have since had reason to change my mind. What prompted him to change his mind was a trip in August 1909 to the hitherto practically unknown eastern coast of northern Luzon. While there, he encountered a group of Negritos who he, whom he said, no doubt, engaged in headhunting. And this is a photograph from that trip that was made in 1909. Uh, and in this caption in National Geographic, he specifies that this is taken on the eastern coast of northern Luzon. Accompanying the article were a number of photographs, such as this, taken in northeastern Luzon, of the people he had encountered that had prompted him to rethink how he had categorized uh, Negritos. What is interesting, however, is that now that he had classified Negritos as headhunters, he included several photographs of Negritos that most definitely were not headhunters, such as this photo taken in February 1901, the same time as he made the one that I showed you at the very beginning, uh, in Mari Valley's Bataan, uh, which is just across Manila Bay from Manila. Uh, in his article, Wooster noted that he had, quote, visited every important region in the Philippine Islands inhabited by Negritos, and that until 1909, none of the Negritos he had encountered had been headhunters. However, now that he had encountered a group who he said were headhunters, Wooster felt free to recontextualize any photograph showing Negritos as photographs now showing members of a headhunting tribe. So, it's, so this article is rife with photographs that long predate 1909, and um, now these are headhunters. Uh, Wooster did not provide dates for the photographs of Negritos in National Geographic. As a result, there was no way for readers uh, of the article to know which photographs showed headhunting Negritos and which didn't. Photography in the colonial context could be used both to emphasize difference between groups of people and to homogenize groups of people who had no sense of shared identity. Wooster's insistence in important differences between civilized Filipino tribes, such as Visayans, Tagalogs, and Ilocanos, is an example of the former. In this article, Wooster used his photographs to create an image of a monolithic headhunting tribe of Negritos, an image that ran counter to his textual assertion that the majority of Negritos were not headhunters. Given the likelihood that most readers spent more time with the photographs than with the text, it is probable that many of them came to see the people in this slide as headhunters too. Near the end of his article, Wooster drew attention, this is the 1912 article again, Wooster drew attention to the people of no man's land. And this is the final example I want to talk about today. No man's land, as he termed it, was an area Wooster described as be being near Lubuagan in the province of Kalinga, quote, where meet the regions inhabited by the Kalingas, the Ifugaos, and the Bontoc Igorots. There has been intermarriage between members of the several tribes, resulting in a blending of physical characteristics and racial customs. And it is difficult to stay with any degree of certainty to what particular tribe of any the people of a given town belong, end quote. 
By way of example, he noted that their, quote, houses resemble the houses of Kalingas, and that the women have adopted some articles of dress from the Kalingas and others from the Tingians, and that the men wear little caps like those of the Bontoc Igorots. In other words, the people of no man's land disrupted Wooster's attempt at creating clear divisions between groups of people. Although the people of no man's land didn't neatly fit into any of Wooster's categories, his classification scheme for his photographs demanded that they do so. This photograph, for example, taken in June 1908, is part of a series of bone talk igorots of Lubuagan, category eight. Although as of yesterday, I now saw that there's a post-it note in the University of Michigan Museum of Anthropology that says that in fact, uh, these are Kalinga. So we're still working this out. Um, so it's, a, it's a part of a series of bone talk igorots of Lubuagan, category eight F, uh, according to the index that Wooster prepared for AIR in 1905 and as I said, also listed as Bontoc Igorot here. The specific caption for this photograph, as it appeared in the, in the index at the New Li Newberry Library in Chicago, is full length front view of two, man, two men in dancing costume. The man at the right is Madelome. Note the bead and button ornaments at the front end of his G-string. Madelome appears in a different photograph too, published in Wooster's 1911 article. As in the Newberry archive and in the University of Michigan archive, the individuals are clearly identified as Bontoc Igorots of Lubuagan. That's how they were identified in 1911. Moreover, in the 1911 article, which you'll recall is about field sports among the wild men of northern Luzon, Madelom and his companions are again identified as dancers. These are picked men who dance for their town on festal occasions. Note the muscular development of their chests. The man on the extreme right holds a head axe in his right hand. They're not identified here as such. That man, again, is, is Madelum. Um, and I just want to actually point out real quickly that this, this photograph also appears in the Philippines past and present. And there, Wooster has drawn uh, police badges uh, onto uh, these men's uh, costumes, OK, to identify them there as actually police officers. Uh, they don't, in the original photograph, have those police badges on. For his 1912 National Geographic article, Wooster changed both the identity of the subjects and the suggested meaning of the photograph. There, the caption read, two men of no man's land showing typical dress and ornaments. A lengthier description of the photograph reads, these people are the last to come under government control and isolated cases of head taking still occur among them. Now remember, these are dancers, dancers who are there for a festival, but now these are you know, headhunters holding axes. Um, there is no explanation for why Wooster decided to reframe Madelom and the other people from Lubuagan in this article, removing them from the category Bontag Igorot and placing them into a liminal zone of no man's land. It could be that such a description was more accurate than the rigid boundaries defined both by the census and by Wooster's archive. Indeed, it is possible that there are a great many liminal communities throughout the Philippines, communities that would disrupt Wooster's formulations if he described and discussed them more honestly than his 31 or 36 categories allowed. And again, the Remontada would disrupt it, the Zamboanganos would disrupt it. These are all people who don't neatly fit one category. In January 1913, Wooster jotted a note on a memorandum he was preparing in conjunction with an illustrated lecture he was scheduled to give at Manila's Grand Opera House. The note read, quote, camera can be made to tell the truth. The truth that Wooster wanted to tell was one proclaiming uh, Filipinos unsuited for self-government, and the thousands of photographs he made of non-Christian Filipinos were made with that goal uh, in mind. However, there are other truths that Wooster's camera can be made to tell as well, truths that reveal more about Wooster and the colonialist ideologies that drove him than about the purported subjects of his photographs. The examples I've shown here help reveal some of those other truths, uh, truths that call into question the categories used by Wooster to classify and categorize Filipinos. The other papers that we've heard this morning reveal other truths about Wooster's representations of race and gender in the colonial Philippines. And this afternoon, we will, heal, we will hear still others. I believe that it is inarguable that Dean Wooster was instrumental in shaping how Americans thought about and envisioned the Philippines through much of the 20th century. The ongoing efforts to carefully rethink and reframe his photographs is important work that can help move us closer to the real truths about power, control, and representation that are at the very heart of the Wooster archive. Thank you.
coincident uh, moments in these papers. Uh, fantastic work. And thank you for the organ. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. No. Yeah. I turned it on. These are on, but your system may not be working. Oh, it's closed. Check. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to use this instead? Uh, and thank you to, to Carla and Deirdre for inviting me to discuss. Uh, I guess one of the, the ways that I, I would start is uh, to think about how these, uh, or the Worcester archive is actually related to empire. And it's kind of, I mean, it's obvious in a lot of ways, but it's, it's this moment at the turn of the 20th century that um, might be useful when we think about uh, the move from governing people, like individuals, to populations, a kind of Foucauldian move. And so if we think about, um, how Michel Foucault describes biopower um, in the history of sexuality. He says that it's the thing that brought life and its mechanisms into the realm of explicit calculations and made knowledge power an agent of transformation of human life. So the thing that, I think, I mean, uh, and uh, Charlie's paper brings this out uh, really clearly is that we could, we could kind of appropriate Foucault and say that colonial biopower brought colonial life and its mechanism to the realm of explicit visualizations, visualizations, not calculations. Because he's, what he's suggesting is that we're moving from calculations and the, the kind of measurement and the anthropometrics of the body to visualization as a kind of shorthand, right? Um, and made photographic power an agent of transformation of, of colonial life. Um, so that's just a kind of provisional thesis statement. Um, so what we see in, in Mark's paper, and, and thank you, uh, I'm, 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 it's an honor to be on this panel because I, I know of their work or know them personally. Uh, Sony was a graduate student, brilliant graduate student, PhD, hire him. Uh, <laughs> Charlie also, brilliant student in, in history. Uh, he was recently on NPR for the uh, discussing race with uh, Michelle Norris. So that was like, wow, cool, I'm on the same panel. Uh, Mark, uh, I haven't, we haven't met, it's, it's good to meet you in person. Uh, he scooped my title of the book. <laughs> my book is called Fantasy Islands, his is called Dean uh, Worcester's Fantasy Islands, and I will say, I'm I'm okay with that. Uh, <laughs> but also, uh, uh, I mean, when it comes to the pronunciation, I'm gonna say, I'm probably gonna say Worcester because that's what I'm used to. Yeah. I think Worcester's better. Uh, <laughs> uh, and and finally, Nerissa is a legend in the uh, in at Berkeley. Uh, she studied in uh, in Barrows Hall, uh, which is uh, you know obviously a colonial. Uh, Philippine colonial administrator. I studied in Wheeler Hall, another uh, uh, administrator. Uh, so I was in English and she was in ethnic studies, but uh, she was legend there when I was, and I was a graduate student there. Uh, okay, so I think the intervention that, that Mark makes, uh, uh, and I'll just listen here to refresh your memory so that we can move to discussion quickly. It's more than just uh, one of the things that he points out is that there was more a distinction between Christian and non-Christian tribes. There's no hierarchy in the original arrangement of photos, and this hierarchy actually was something that emerged and that actually had to be worked on by Mark. And that's a really fascinating um, kind of intellectual project. Um, Worcester actually bucked up against the census, um, which is a fascinating prospect. So it wasn't, empire wasn't self-same, right? That, that's an interesting in inconsistency. Um, photographs showed members of groups that were enlisted in the census, and there were contradictory captions. So all these things, and we, we notice all that black space, um, they're just m multiple gaps, and it's impossible to account for the gaps. I mean, actually, I mean, accounting for absence is an impossibility. Uh, so I'm wondering, when you say that their um, photographs belied more truths about Worcester than his objects, um, I was wondering if you could say more. Like, what do the truths say about Worcester? What does it say about colonial um, archival production? <laughs> um, and you, this is a quote from your paper. I'm, I'm thankful that they distributed their papers in advance. Uh, it is possible that the photographs were less important in terms of their accuracy than they were in presenting to American readers of the census report and of the 1905 Ge National Geographic article that reprinted many of these photographs, the scope of the civilizing project that lay before them. So in other words, uh, the fantasy is more important than the accuracy, right? And so what is it about the kind of compulsion to organize that speaks to the, the fantasy? And what, what, what are the excesses that, that those black spaces actually conceal? Uh, Charlie, unearthing a new archive by Barrows, uh, the circular of information, which gives us circular information. Uh, <laughs> and it's also known as the, the, the Bureau of Christian Tribes. Um, so what he's tracking is the emergence of the colonial state 
we, we can't imagine the state as something that was self-standing, that was merely exported. Um, and what Charlie's showing is something that, something that I regard is the state has to be consolidated, right? Um, and this is something that Alfred McCoy also, <coughs> also uh, claims. Um, he points out Barrow's anthropometrics, measuring of human bodies in 1901, and the racial schema was reproduced thoroughly in the arrangement of the photographs. And his argument is basically that photos supplanted um, the, uh, the measurement techniques. Um, so both uh, uh, Mark and Charlie talk about which is organization of the photo or the archive, Rice on page three of your papers and, and, and Sullivan on page 27. Uh, what is it the attention to the organization and then Worcester uh, settled on this organizing system tell us? How does it speak to the visual regimes and colonial surveillance and their intended technologies? What, I mean, why this shift? Is there, is there, is there perhaps a causation? Um, or is it just, we were talking earlier, it's not about his being uh, ethnographically lazy. It's just about, is it about bandwidth? Could you just say more about why this shift into photographs? Um, let's see. Uh, Sony's talk, uh, I, I, I have a lot to say about this. Uh, I mean, it's the most theoretically uh, dense. Uh, um, and so basically, and, and I'm gonna try to recap recapitulate your argument. Um, a lot of Philippine nationalists re inherited heteromasculinist regimes of uh, colonial power and they deployed them when uh, uh, the state expanded southward into Mindanao, right? Um, so what he's trying to get at is something that he talks about as a current analytic, which is settler colonial logic. And so this is new. And I, I just want to point out this is a new intervention. No one has talked, I mean, very few people have talked about the Philippine, the colonial state as, a, as settler colonial. It's usually understood as administratively colonial. It's not the incorporation of states, uh, individual uh, sovereign territories, previously sovereign territories into the sovereignty of the United States, but rather uh, the expropriation of imperialist ideas, right? So this is, uh, Julian Goh talks about this as administrative colonization or colonialism rather than settler. So that's really a kind of huge intervention that you're making into, and I believe it. Um, but I wanna ask you, what's at stake in calling it settler colonialism? Because it's actually, the nation, the post-colonial nation, or the, the colonial nation of the Philippines, nationalists that are deploying that settler colonial logic, right? Um, Anarisa argues that the production of abjection is the creation of images and discourses from these sites that are racially repugnant and sexually erotic yet formative to American imperial identity. Uh, could you please just uh, spell out or we talk a little bit more about um, the, fi the three figures you posit, the dead insurrecto, the Filipina's breast, and the dark-skinned child, uh, might be seen in varied ways as sexually erotic. Uh, you talk about them as both repugnant and still uh, fascinating for the, for the desire that they, that they might capture. Um, I don't know if that's sexual, and could you just uh, tell me how it is? I mean, I believe you. Um, can you say more how the erotic might be, uh, in Chris Davis' words, the apprehensive desire or unconscious motive? of wanting to fuck something. Um, and I think that the last paper, or the, the, the last paper I'm talking about here, the, the uh, uh, Narisa's piece, um, speaks to gender and sexuality, uh, uh, and we can map it back onto the other papers. So it was a really interesting, strange gender contradiction that you point out, that the Kalinga man is then a Kalinga woman or a girl elsewhere, and it's the same figure. And uh, in uh, the Philippines past and present, uh, uh, Worcester's book uh, from the 14, right? Uh, he calls the, he is told by a tour guide that the Kalingas were queer people. I'm not suggesting <laughs> that, you know, that there was a kind of association here, but one of the things that I get at in my book is that queer was also a racially signifying colonial trope, rather before it was a sexual trope, before it was actually about non-normative sexuality. Um, is, there, is there more about, about that? Why was this kind of like confusion? Uh, Charlie? Male circumcision, I know it's uh, your feature project. <laughs> um, but it reminds me of the, the measurement of GMTI, uh, reminds me of the uh, immigration surveillance that was happening in the United States, um, where uh, like abnormal genitalia was a marker of who and who could not enter the United States and actually was a marker of perversion and degeneracy. Um, and if you had you know, genitalia that was too short, you were known as a public charge. Uh, and so that was later the figure of the homosexual, right? Um, the person who was expropriating uh, the welfare state's resources. Uh, 
What's that? Too large. Too large, right. Too large, yeah, you were fine. <laughs> uh, Sony, uh, so what is the relationship of the heteromasculinism that you locate uh, and the instantiation of settler colonialism that you're trying to determine? Um, Science-based heteromasculinism, it's, it's, it's analogous, your reasoning. So I think the science-based heteromasculinist nationalism is to female labor as U.S. settler colonialism is to Muslim indigenous populations, right? Is there more than just analogy there? Is there, is there a kind of cross-hatching um, that might be going on? Um, what's at stake again in settler colonialism? And how might the native or the archive show something beyond this analogy? Um, and so finally, uh, again, back, uh, must nakedness always be regarded as a purient? Um, there seems to be a distinction between the Worcester photos that you, the, the one you start off with, with the woman's recumbent in front of the foliage. Um, and she, seems, she looks like she's gonna be a trap. <laughs> um, like if you actually approach her, that you know, the insurrectos will actually, maybe it's just my stupid fantasy is going on. Uh, the insurrectos will like, come behind the bushes and yeah, cut your head off or your, whatever. Uh, I know, right, the, 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 the floor collapses behind you. I mean, this is something I've actually noticed in, in the, in the, in the um, um, political cartoons that I've examined. Um, but there's a difference between that and the kind of like, um, the portraits that are, that are captured by the Worcester um, archive, right? Um, I, there's, there's certainly continuity, but I'm wondering what is the connection or, I mean, is it the same the part of the kind of same cultural imaginary or um, cultural war that uh, Campomones talks about in terms of empire building? So I'm, that's all I'm gonna say, and thank you for this wonderful, wonderful panel. It's an honor to be here, and I'll just open it up, unless you all wanna respond. I, you know, it's because it is biblical, it is in the Bible, and so maybe the mention of the circumcised uh, male, Filipino male, might suggest that the possibility of, of uh, ci being civilized because they are Judeo-Christian bodies, you know, so I, I was just thinking about that, you know, so, so maybe that might be, that's why it was mentioned, you know. But um, can I respond? So um, uh, I, I think that uh, the reason why I showed these different photographs, uh, the only photographs from, from Wooster, I can't even say his name, Wooster, Wooster, whatever, um, Wooster's um, collection is the, the women, you know, the, the, the naked uh, women. So that's really from uh, the collection uh, from uh, uh, Professor uh, Sinopoli's uh, CD, um, and it's a, it's a wonderful um, uh, resource for research as well as for teaching. Um, and I've used it also, but um, I mean for teaching and also for my uh, presentation today. But the point I wanted to make, because objection as, an, as a discourse, the way Kristeva talks about it, there are different um, emotions connected to abjection, you know, so it isn't just sexual. Mm -hmm. uh, it, is, it is also about being uh, aroused, being repulsed, being, um, uh, be, you know, being, um, uh, having a negative reaction, you know. So uh, I wanted to try to capture her ideas about objection by showing different bodies, different parts, you know, uh, different uh, images that still are part of the puzzle of the Imperial Archive. And uh, Wooster was an important um, fabulist in this, you know, in this uh, creation of the, of the Filipino uh, savage or the Filipino native. So um, I, I think that, um, and, and it's, it's very interesting after seeing these photographs, it, you could see how emotions are still part of the archive. I mean, people speak to Mark's presentation, like, you know, or a researcher would say they took the photograph and brought it back to, you know, the, the people that were photographed. So th this is the power of, of the visual image, you know. So, um, uh, and, and it isn't an innocent one. Uh, Wooster was very much part of the counterinsurgency efforts that were, be, that were uh, being conducted by Elwell Otis. You know, I mean, um, he has a very unflattering profile in Alfred McCoy's um, book. Um, uh, you know, the on uh, what is this? The uh, uh, I, I forget the title of uh, McCoy's book. Policing, Emp right. Policing Empire. Yeah. So there's an entire um, you know sections on Wooster and. 
uh, the, what I mentioned about him typing away every morning is actually from McCoy, you know, so um, surveillance was very much part of the project of the American colonial government and, uh, you know, the chief, um, you know, uh, expert in this was Wooster, you know, so um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, um, and I, I mentioned it jokingly, but I also mentioned this because it is a serious thing. Um, you know, uh, Wooster is the man who basically closed the El Renacimiento, you know, and the El Renacimiento was an important nationalist newspaper at the turn of the 20th century, you know, um, and it was because uh, Fidel Reyes wrote <laughs> Aves de Rapina, which was an editorial about Wooster and how he mentioned him as a vulture, an owl, a vampire, etc. But more importantly, they were trying to expose, Fidel Reyes, the journalist, was trying to expose that this man is, the, you know, uh, is, is responsible for uh, many policies. He's a very influential man. Um, uh, and he uses his power to be able to uh, make himself rich. You know, his trips to Benguet, his trips to the mountain province were not innocent. He became a very wealthy man because of uh, mining companies started in the north as well as uh, hotels. And he was able to use his position as interior secretary to make himself wealthy. You know, so his book in 1914, which was the, what was the book? The Philippines Past and Present. The Philippines Past and Present. Some, um, some uh, writers and scholars say that he wrote Philippines Past and Present as a response uh, to, um, to allegations, to rumors that the Interior Secretary made himself rich. So by the time he wrote his book, Philippines Past and Present in 1914, he was no longer, uh, in, he was no longer in the Philippines, right? He was, right. he was no longer a Philippine colonial servant or a Philippine colonial official he would never think of himself as a servant. <laughs> um, and he was no longer a Philippine colonial official. So he, um, it was a way to, to um, put himself in a very positive light, you know. So um, I, I, I mention this because I, I loved what, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, Professor Mendoza said about how the fantasy is more important than accuracy. We heard, um, you know, very good, um, you know, um, very uh, uh, critical examination of, um, you know, the processes of this man, you know, uh, and he, he used his, his expertise as a, as a scientist to create certain fantasies, certain images about the Philippines. So I, I think it's very important that we, we, re we realize how science was used, that there has to be a, a critical understanding of his, um, uh, his profession and his legacy. Savage. Sure. Well, I think this is actually one of the reasons, and Carla can talk to this more about why, in fact, this whole conference has been brought together. Is uh, when I started working a few years ago with Carla on this, one of the first things she said to me is, "And look at these images, and what do we do with them? Can we just put them up on the web or not? And we have to figure out how to handle this as a collection." So I think that the the eth the ethical issue is exactly the reason for this conference. It's exactly, and I think it's going to be being discussed in the afternoon. Uh, much more explicitly. Um, I think the science part is interesting, but first of all, thank you, and I want to I wanna get your permission to use that changed Foucault <laughs> as I recast this article, um, because I think that, I think you've, you've got the point. I think that the measurement does slip away 
but that the visualization, in fact, is fully informed by a bunch of that. Um, and this issue of accuracy and fantasy plays into that as well. Um, and I think we can see in the 1903 census, uh, first of all, there are three censuses, not one census. There's a census for the civilized, which is the Philippine census of themselves. Um, and what happens to do that is that they, 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 they think that they're going to need at least um, 5,000 census workers to do that. And their estimate is that there are only 7,000 fully educated Filipinos. So um, in other words, everyone who's fully educated is going to have to be brought into the census. So what they do is that for each of the provinces, they appoint the governor as the head of the census, and, that, and they give him 250 extra dollars of gold. Um, and then they bring them to Manila over Christmas, basically, and they fully instruct them on how to fill out every single form. They make them fill out the forms themselves to make sure that they fully understand what's going to happen. and then. These, these guys go out and th because they're obsessed with it, there's this fetish fetishization of accuracy. And the, d the data tables in the 1903 census are exhaustive. I've had my students work with them and boy, the things that this data down to the individual count is amazing. Whether it's, you know, whether people made stuff up or not, who knows. But there was this idea that we have to, we have to get all this data, right? The next one down for the for the Moros, they worked with the Datus to sort of do something together, and that was done by military U.S. military officers. And then for the non-Christian tribes, it was done by um, by Americans. And with each level down, the accuracy of the data slips. Um, so the uh, the the wild peoples are counted by estimating numbers of houses in settlements and estimating numbers of people per house, and that sort of gives you that. But there's none of this same data that you can see uh, for the other. So I think there's a slipperiness of that, which when the visual comes in, allows for the non-Western, uh, for the non-civilized to sort of be categorized in so many different ways in different places, because the visual image is much slipperier in some ways than even the data that they have. So I think there's something going in there about science. Um, and interestingly, as the Filipino nationalists start to press against these images, the, they make a specific exemption for the use of images, busts, engravings, whatever, that are used to uh, demonstrate a scientific principle. Because if they were to speak out against science, they, of course, would be setting themselves up to not be civilized enough to, to run the Philippines, yeah? So, so they, there's actually, I mean, a loophole in this. If you wanted to drive a truck through it, you could, because you just say, well, this is science, and therefore we can do anything we want. At the same time, they're clearly pressing against the, the use of these images in the metropole to, to advance Worcester's political agenda. So this is representing one person, but I would be curious about any anyone sitting at that table's perspective. They could speak a little bit more pointedly to um, visual elements and to visual rhetoric, thinking about rhetoric that's persuasive, um, rhetoric as persuasion, um, and how, because I was really struck by the shift from anthropometric to image, right? And so how in the end there's a practical element, you know, you can't get all the data, but there's also a different sort of persuasion that and I know there's many people in the room, correct me if I'm wrong about this, wasn't the first film screened at the White House Birth of a Nation, and wasn't it framed specifically in terms of Filipino self-governance? And so that some of those connections to American race ideology have to do, um, you know, not just with indigenous people in the United States, but obviously through the black experience in America. And so that there was some sort of persuasive element of that film, you know, famous try to attempt at least some of that. I hadn't, I, I knew about Birth of the Nation in the White House. I hadn't heard it in relations to the Philippines. I, uh, that's like 15 years ago, I took a film studies class and they studied that. It might be a possibility. Uh, who knows? I don't know. It's it'd be interesting if, I, if that were the case. Um, you know, my, 
entry into this project was as somebody who's interested in, in photography primarily. Uh, I did live in the Philippines for two years as a Peace Corps volunteer back in the 1980s. Uh, and so when this project appeared before me, it pulled new interest and old interest together. Um, but what I'm interested in is how, like the social functions of photographs, how do they circulate, how do they operate? And so one of the reasons why my project has been so archivally intense is because all these photographs that circulate in magazines and in books, I want to see how they exist outside their public performances in these sort of private spaces. And, and, and that allows new questions to sort of emerge. One of the things that I've always wondered is, you know, how much influence did Wooster's photographs actually have? And you can't measure that directly unless somebody flat out says, I was persuaded by this. Um, but what you get is James Blount's uh, book, The American Occupation of the Philippines, where he talks about Wooster's, the P.T. Barnum of the non-Christian tribe industry, and about people being humbugged by the Wooster Kodaks, okay? You have Manuel uh, Quezon talking, and this is in congressional record, uh, rhetorically adopting the voice of a, of a retentionist, saying, you know, behold the, the native being uh, converted into, uh, into you know, a, a soldier. Well, he's referring to this Igoro sequence, I think, that Wooster is showing time and again. And then you have the Philippine Assembly passing bills in 1914 and 1915, banning the taking of photographs, the display of photographs. You have the new colonial administration in the Philippines shutting down the ethnological survey and then pulling back all the photographs saying, we're gonna hold on to these, but no one's gonna get to see these things anymore. So there's evidence that you can accumulate, a preponderance of evidence that these things did have impact but the degree to which they actually influenced the, the debates on the Jones Bill, let's say, which is what Wooster was heavily involved in at this time, I don't think we can ever say precisely that it, they were determinative in, in how those debates went. But certainly they were a large part of the conversation on both sides. development of the town, the, the number of people, all these kinds of things that you that, that was done in 1903. You know, I figured, well, science has been doing it after the colonial government. And that is an important, in, important information for the 50s. Because there's really nothing that we can see about the Philippines at that time. Well, and as the Filipino uh, ilustrados sort of elite uh, starting in 1912 and 13, starts to be given, or in 1914, to be given some control. In fact, where they look is, is uh, Mindanao, and their own rhetoric is highly scientific, is their own rhetoric is highly, highly involved with uh, education. There's a discussion about whether Muslims, Muslim girls should actually be educated in boarding schools because that's the only place it could be done effectively. So using the rhetorics of American race uh, and Native Americans. Um, the whole thing just sort of shifts over, but that's why I love Mark's word slippery because it, you know things get out there and they just shift in the ether. But um, the I, I think one of the reasons that, that works not just in the Philippines, it works also I would argue in Indonesia, it works also in the British colonies, is that you still have a hierarchical, a racially hierarchical imagination of humanity. And the elites, even if they're almost on the verge of civilization, are still at the top. Mm -hmm. And so they have a vested interest in repopulating re that, that sense of stuff. And if you go to Manila today and you go to a mall and you know you're too masa, they don't let you in. And they still think that your skin is too dark, even though next you know, you're not. So it's still playing out in the Philippines. It's playing out between Manila Center Tagalog dominance over Cebuanos represent, you know, um, it's all, it's all still there. <laughs>